Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Birmingham Real Estate Investor. I am one of your hosts, Spencer Sutton, and I've got with me my co-host, Matthew Whitaker. Matthew, welcome. Ah, thank you. Glad to be back. And today I'm excited because we've got a great guest on. We have a Birmingham native and longtime investor in the city. So uh, Price Hightower, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, I guess that's just a kind way of saying that I'm a lot older than Spencer and Matthew, right? <laughs> that's not necessarily <laughs> not true. true. <laughs> not true. So uh, really funny story. Uh, I think I've got the two guys on this podcast <clears throat> that may have played the biggest part in uh, me being uh, stuck in the house business. Uh, Spencer, as everybody knows and well-documented on the show, sold me my first rental house and price when I was first thinking about investing in rental homes, you actually worked with my stepdad for a while over at South Trust Bank. And he said that you had quit your job and started uh, buying and selling houses, I think, uh, flipping houses. Isn't that kind of how you got into it? And then you and I literally met no, no more than 50 feet from where I'm sitting in the office next door to us. And I remember very clearly going in there and meeting you and just thinking how you had it all together. So you still have it all together. And I still think uh, you, you're, you're way ahead. So uh, very excited to have you on here, Price. Do you remember us connecting by any chance? Or I, I do remember. I had forgotten the, I had forgotten the banking connection uh, because I did start my career um, uh, as a banker with South Trust Bank and worked there for about five and a half years. But I had forgotten that connection. But I do remember our meeting, yes. Talk about the conversion from going from banker. What did you do as a banker? And then actually moving into kind of where did you start in the real estate world? Sure. So I might back up a step before that. Uh, I grew up uh, here in Birmingham and my father was a business owner and he and I were just really, really, really close. And um, you'll notice a theme throughout our conversation today, Matthew, is that um, I'm a huge believer in a quote that I, I read one time and it said, if you ever see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, you will know we had a lot of help getting there. <laughs> And uh, I am definitely that turtle sitting on top of a fence post and a ton of people such as yourself uh, have helped get me there. And so, and, but my dad was one of those guys. And so I just grew up in a, in an environment where uh, he was a business owner and he assumed some risk in his business. And so to me, you know, I, I really had a nice leg up on a whole bunch of people just by thinking that that was normal as opposed to a corporate lifestyle looking normal. And so that, that was that's a really big part of uh, of my story is just growing up in a very stable household, uh, one where my dad spent a lot of intentional time pouring into me. Uh, he was a very successful level five kind of a, a business owner. And um, so to me, it just sort of seemed like that's what I was supposed to do is one day own my own business. So uh, I went to work uh, when I graduated from Auburn. I got a job at South Trust and was in commercial lending and learned a little bit about banking, did that for about five and a half years. And I was involved in a uh, local ministry in town called Young Business Leaders. And there was a guy who was on staff with Young Business Leaders named Jay Briley. And Jay and I got to be good friends. And he was leading a, a small group Bible study and, uh, with me and some other guys. And he got his real estate license and was one of the first uh, real estate uh, agents with LAH. LAH had just started. And so Jay was in Bible study one day and he said, Price, you know, I think I could find a house somewhere in Homewood that we could buy and fix up and sell if you could get us the money. You're, you're a banker. See if you can do that. So I was able to get some money and Jay was able to find a house. And so we bought a house over on Melrose Place off of Broadway and we did our first flip. And that sort of sounds normal now, but really back then, I mean, I'm 54 now, and I think I started this business with Jay, uh, you know, I was about 25 or 26. It really wasn't a thing. There were a few people in town flipping houses, but there certainly were not infomercials about it, and there were not podcasts about it, and it wasn't, um, you know, an HGTV segment by any stretch of the imagination. So 
I, th- I think it really helped. It was a good time to enter the market. But so Jay and I flipped maybe a, a dozen houses together and I decided it was more fun to flip houses than it was to sell money for the bank. And again, I was just kind of wired to be my own guy. So I took a pretty significant leap when I was 27. So when I was 27, my wife, Meg, and I had our first child. I left my job at the bank and she left her job at Bell South. And I said, I'll be a real estate investor. So I, I really did not have nearly enough capital to be doing that. Uh, and while, while my dad had been a successful business person um, and uh, was a was a great mentor of mine, um, I really decided since I did not enter into his business that I kind of wanted to do my business journey without his capital. So I was thinly capitalized from day one and had to um, – had probably to hustle more as a result of that. But yeah, I just started, started my, uh, my business really flipping houses when flipping was not a thing. And talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I would love to dig in a little bit into your, some of the lessons you learned from your dad and how they've applied to your, uh, what started out as investing and then got into some, uh, home building later, but talk about maybe the top two or three lessons you learned from your dad. Probably one of the greatest benefits that I received from my dad was how he modeled and required uh, self-discipline. And, uh, you know, he he was a self-disciplined man and he taught me to be self-disciplined. I, I will admit that I'm a late bloomer. I don't think I really became a man until I was about 27. I sort of, I, I was a kid for too long, but, um, you know, the, the, the verse in, um, in Corinthians, it says, when I became a man, I put aside childish things. Somehow when I became a man, I really turned it on. And, and that had been modeled to me by my dad, even though I was a bit of a late bloomer. So I think self-discipline has been a huge factor in the success uh, of, of tower homes is that we really, really focus on doing what we do well. And we really don't try to do the things that we don't do well. And that's, very consistent with the, uh, you know, the flywheel that you read about in, in good to great by Jim Collins, just, you know, kind of getting that flywheel turning. And we have found the best way to keep that turning is by focusing on what we do well and just try to hit as many singles as possible and don't really get distracted with trying to hit a home run. And I think that takes a lot of self-discipline in real estate. Um, you know, uh, my dad was a great guy, but he and I share uh, another thing. We, we both enjoy working hard. So I've got a lot of hobbies. I love to hunt, fish, play golf, do all that kind of stuff. Um, but honestly, I, I, I just like to work. And so enjoying what you do and applying a lot of passion to that, I think, uh, is great fuel on the real estate fire. And I, th- I think that was another thing that he taught me is just to love what you're doing as much as you love your hobbies. You mentioned something about hitting a bunch of singles. And that's something that I've found, you know, throughout my career is that as real estate investors, or when you're doing something, it's like the singles get boring. And then it feels like you need to like up the game, start swinging harder, swinging, trying to hit home runs, or at least hit doubles and triples. I would love for you to talk about I mean, my experience has been when you're hitting singles every now and then you'll get a double and a home run. That's more of a lucky, uh, or, or you're in the, you're, you're, you capitalize on a lucky opportunity. Can you talk about the focus on hitting singles and have you ever seen people that are just trying to hit home run after home run and end up striking out? Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, singles are boring. Singles are really conservative. Uh, My wife and I love to uh, use the statement around our home with our kids. Nobody should ever miss a layup. And uh, even though in my basketball career, I vividly remember missing some. In theory, that is the easiest shot on a basketball court. And you really shouldn't miss a layup. And so when you're thinly capitalized, as I was when I began my career, the only shots I could take were layups. I I really didn't have the luxury of trying a three-pointer and hoping it worked and risking a significant loss. And so I think I just started off, I'm sort of conservative by nature, so I'm probably in the wrong industry. But, um, you know, my comfort level is just more single based and I never really wanted to go backwards. And you can read so many books. I mean, Darren Hardy has a great book called The Compound Effect and just the whole concept of just stringing together, um, you know, a dozen singles and, you know, uh, as I mentioned, Jay and I probably flipped a dozen homes. I mean, I, I don't know how many homes I have 
uh, built now, but I'm going to assume that between the remodels and flips and the new homes that we've built, I probably hit 2000 singles and over, over the past 25 years and they just add up. So I don't know. I don't think I've ever hit a home run. I'm not sure that I've ever hit a double. I mean, I just, it's just been a lot of singles and, you know, uh, your, your listeners that can't see just what a conservative dorky guy I am like you guys can while we're on zoom, there's nothing about this face that's glamorous or sexy or brilliant. It's just, it's just a grinder. And I think, um, you know, there's kind of a beauty in the grind. There's sort of a self-confidence that comes from the grind, knowing that you uh, have the perseverance to to just keep grinding, keep working, keep hitting singles with the belief that over time, the singles will, will pay off. I, and I think this business price is the temptation is to go after home runs, right? Sure. That's the temptation. And that's what we see, you know, and, and Matthew and I, and you have probably seen many investors come and go by trying to swing for the fence every single time. Um, but I just want to say, like you were around before I started, which I started in 2003. And I remember hearing your name around town. I think at one point you were building new homes in Irondale, which I thought, who is building new homes in Irondale? This is, this is crazy, but you were doing it, but it's just, you were playing the long game and it was just, again, singles, singles, singles. And, and for our listeners, like having that mindset, having the self-discipline, willing to just to put in the work day after day is really how you build success. So kudos to you for that. That's great. Well, thank you. It's, it's not glamorous. And there are some guys who've hit a lot of home runs in town and have done a really great job. And um, it's, it's just not ever really been what I was suited to do. And I, I think, you know, knowing who you are, knowing what you're comfortable doing, being able to sleep at night, uh, being able to focus, having a long-term vision, all those things have, have served me well and, and our company well. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger often talk about, you know, don't, don't lose money. And to me, that's what singles are. When my, uh, if my, if you ever ask my wife, like one word to describe Matthew, because she's being nice, she'd say disciplined. What she means by discipline is boring. And, uh, and so I have, I like you have found that just getting up every day and grinding for single after single, um, is, is kind of the way to build a business without too many, uh, you know, without the threat of losses. I would love, sure. I would love to start building on your story. So you went from flipping houses and at some point you actually moved in and started building houses. Can you talk about that transition? Sure. So, um, you know, I started off flipping houses with Jay and then we sort of both pursued our own businesses, uh, in different ways. And, and I, I kept flipping, but I was really, really in the search of two things. I, I knew that I needed more capital to do what I wanted to do. And I was looking for scale and, and I really was not able to find scale in flipping. I, I was not as sophisticated in it as you guys are. And um, the other thing I was looking for was a business instead of a job. And I, and I realized I'd left a very sophisticated business at South Trust Bank, and I thought that I'd started my own business, but really what I'd started was a job. And, and everybody does if they start off as a thinly capitalized real estate investor, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I was still tremendously proud of my job and, and the work that I was doing, and, and it was paying me very well. But at the end of the day, if I didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done. Therefore, by definition, I had a job instead of a business. And so you know, a book like E-Myth was very instrumental to me as it kind of um, tells the stories of people who transition from a job into a more sophisticated business through uh, through scale and repetition. So, um, you know, I, I just I, I couldn't quite get to where I wanted to go with flipping. And so I had some friends, uh, really some, some builders who, who were at my church who I just I asked them, how do you, like literally asked them the question, how do you build a house? And I uh, had a guy named Stuart Banks, um, who is one of the premier builders in town. But when he was starting out, I got to know him through another friend, Fred Smith. And all these guys are sort of part of my fence post. You know, all these guys have, have been kind enough to pour into me and hopefully I have poured into them as well. And it's been a mutually beneficial relationship. But um, Stuart Banks sort of taught me how to build houses. Some guys at my church taught me how to build houses and um, you know, what I was, what I was looking at. And the reason why I was pursuing building is because I was running all over town trying to do flips. And the most I could ever do in a year was maybe 25 or 30 of them. 
And I would look and as I'm driving around, I would pass these subdivisions. And I would look at a cul-de-sac and one guy had bought all these lots on a cul-de-sac and was just sort of building his way around that cul-de-sac. And I'm like, that looks like scale. That looks like scale in real estate to me. And I'd like to learn how to do that. And then if I can learn how to do that, maybe I don't have to be the guy doing everything. Maybe I could hire a superintendent. Maybe I could hire a real estate agent. I could begin to leverage my time better and I could begin to transition into a business. So that was the motivation behind learning to build. And a lot of guys really poured into me. Another one that did is a guy named Brett Winford. Uh, Brett has been, Brett has been a lifelong friend, uh, man for so long. And, And he really taught me how to go from being a builder of one or two homes into how to build a bunch of homes and being a production builder. And um, he and I uh, partnered together on some subdivisions down in uh, the Calera area and built hundreds of homes. And he taught me how to operate a home building company where we could build a hundred homes a year instead of just one or two. So um, yeah, it was, it was a search for scale and it was a search to transition my business from a job into more of a business that could function without relying solely on my effort. Price, the interesting thing, uh, going back to the first time that we met, that was your message to me was find something that you can scale. I, I guess you were going through this kind of, you know, change in your kind of career and what you, the way you were seeing the business. And you said the one problem with flipping houses is it's not scalable. Uh, and I think we've actually, some, since then, there have been some people in town that have scaled it to some degree, but, but that, was, that, that was your message to me when, when we met was uh, to try to find something that would scale. But it took me forever to figure, to, to listen to your message. Now, finally, I guess almost 17, 18 years later, we're, we're just now starting to scale a business. So heart, being a little hard headed, it took me forever. And you, you were Brother, way ahead you, You've that. scaled the business. Don't, don't begin to, to, <laughs> to try to push that off. You have definitely scaled the business. So I used to go around town telling everybody there's only one or two builders that built and made it through the recession. And one of those is Price Hightower. I still saw Hightower signs out down on Lakeshore, um, kind of, uh, you were building kind of down Oxmoor Lakeshore area. Right. So I would love to know, what do you attribute being so successful or at least surviving that recession 2007 through 2010 recession? Well, you know, there's a lot of things and luck is certainly one of them. Um, and you know, we, we, we got a lot of lucky breaks during that, that season. Um, and that was an incredibly difficult season uh, of my life. Uh, personally, professionally, that was really, really tough. I lost my dad in 2009 in a, in a big, in a car accident and business was horrible. Nothing was working. And, and I just, um, you know, 2009 was a really, really tough year. Uh, but it was a year where, I, I really relied on some of the um, foundational things that we discussed earlier. The fact that I had not been trying to hit home runs and was content stringing together singles and hitting, uh, hitting singles instead of doubles, triples, and home runs really helped us. Some of the guys who had been swinging for home runs in the home building industry did not survive uh, that, that season of time because they had too big of positions in land and lots. And we fortunately just didn't. Um, and that was a big factor, I, but I'll be honest with you. And, and, um, I realize it's a real estate, uh, podcast and not a faith podcast, but my faith had a huge, uh, was a huge factor in the success that I was lucky enough to experience in 09. And that, uh, on February the 11th of 2006 at 3 AM, uh, I woke up at, uh, and, and I really can't repeat what I said, but uh, the first word was, Oh, and uh, I, I got up out of bed, went to my home office and just pulled out my financial statements. And I began to look at how highly leveraged I was. And again, this is 2006. Everything is selling like crazy. And, you know, I made, a, I made a pot of coffee and I would look at my balance sheet and then I would get up and I'd walk around to the corner of my desk where my Bible was. And I would just pray. And I'd pray. I said, God, if you can show me how to get out of this, I promise you, I won't get back in. And, uh, so I got scared in 06 instead of getting scared in 09. And I, and I can only attribute that to faith there. Um, I don't know. I can't tell you any other reason why I would have woken up at 3 a.m., but when I left my office uh, around 6 a.m. that day, I was a different 
business owner. And I was a man on a mission to get right sized and to reduce our leverage. At the time I was leveraged about 23 to one. And honestly, that was not even an unusual thing. I, I was very bankable at be, being leveraged 23 to one. Um, and, you know, today we're just a fraction of that. So um, I, I think those things really were factors in, in our success. Two things that come to mind, just listening to your story. Number one is the, the lessons that I'm pulling out of it is success is not linear and people need to understand that. I think people look at you from the outside and think, oh, you know, he's always been successful and it's always just been kind of like a steady climb up the success mountain. And the more we talk, it just reminds me that nobody's climb up the mountain is consistent. And even, even us at Evernest with our business, it, it grows in plateaus. There are times where it's just, it feels very boring around here, very stagnant. And then all of a sudden it gets crazy and wild and grows again in plateaus. So that would be one of the things that I'm pulling out of uh, just listening to you. The other thing is uh, going back to Jim Collins, good to great is just confronting the brutal facts. It seems to me that one of the reasons that you were able to survive the recession was you weren't getting caught up in all the hoopla of everything going on in 2006. And you started to look under the rocks at all the squiggly things and realize, Oh my gosh, this is, this is not a sustainable thing. And if, if anything bad happens, then I'm going to go down with the ship. And so I think it's about making objective decisions, even in the face when it doesn't look like, uh, it, you know, everybody else is going in one direction and you turn around and go the other and people might've thought you were crazy, but, uh, but kudos to you because in the end you were the one that was uh, standing, uh, still standing. Matthew and I were waking up in the middle of the night wondering how we could borrow more money. We weren't. I get it. <laughs> in 2006. And I did that throughout my entire 30s. Yeah, I, I did a lot of that. Um, but I do, you know, it's funny. In about 2008 or 2007, I guess it was, I, I was on the uh, board of directors for the Home Builders Association. And I walked into a meeting and I, I was aggressively selling stuff in 06 and 07. And I, I was I was selling land at a loss. I was like the only guy on the planet losing money in real estate uh, in 06 <laughs> and 07 because houses and everything were selling so well. And I walked into uh, the, the meeting and I vividly remember saying, well, here comes Chicken Little who's saying the sky is falling. And uh, at the time, I kind of took it, you know, kind of tough. I mean, I was still relatively new to the industry. And, you know, an older guy had said that to me. And, you know, it, it kind of stung a little bit at the moment. But, um, you know, in, in, in reality, um, being scared early was, was very helpful. Talk about post, uh, post-recession and kind of we've been on a bull run in the 2010s the market's been great. Houses have been selling, I would imagine pretty consistently from 2012 to, to today, 2021. Talk about kind of your house selling business from, from then until now. Yeah. So uh, somehow we showed a profit in 2009 and that was uh, to me the most significant business achievement of my 27 year career in real estate is that we found a way to make money. We went from selling, maybe 110 homes to, I think we sold 42. Uh, we sold, we had 40 some odd finished homes on the ground on January 1st of 2009. We did not have a single sale in January. We had one in February and I think we might've written two contracts in March and we were used to selling about 10 a month. And I just wasn't sure how we were going to make it. Um, but anyway, so I think, you know, that was a very pivotal year. Then uh, we started, uh, I just got, I honestly, you know, I got so mad in 09 because we had some banks that were calling our loans and uh, it really, really made me mad because we were current, we were profitable. And I'm looking at these bankers. I'm like, look, I, tiny little tower homes is making more money than your bank. What are you doing calling our <laughs> loan? And, and they literally would say, we have to call your loan because we know you're bankable and you can move it to somewhere else. And we have most of our other builders aren't in your position. So we got to call your loan. We got to kick out the good guys. We got to keep the bad exposure. ones. We're going to keep, right. the, keep bad the bad ones and get rid of the good to. ones. They had to right. because of, because the federal, and I understood, but that's just not what you want to hear when you're in the heat of battle. So I got so mad. And so I said, okay, what, how can I, I just, how can we turn the, the turn the tide? So in, in 
in the middle of, of 09, I, I called uh, a, a meeting with our employees at Tower, and we simply have the best people uh, who work in our in our organization. And I said, here's the thing. Uh, the Great Recession is not going to be applicable to Tower Homes. We're not going to participate in it. And we're going to go on the offensive. And so I started going to the banks and I started buying lots like crazy. And in 2009 and 10 and 11, we literally bought hundreds of lots. So I'd, I'd sold some stuff kind of at a loss, you know, going into the thing. And I'd, I'd gotten that capital that I so desperately needed. And then we deployed that capital at a time where things were still somewhat scary. But man, we're firing a rifle. We're not shooting a shotgun. I mean, we're getting the best lots in the best location at the lowest price, and I'm getting them for pennies on the dollar. So we ended up having a record year in 2010, a record year in 11, record year in 12, and just um, really emerged a much stronger company. I have and this at the picture. end, they can call me Chicken Little. They can call me whatever they want. You know, at that point, but they're calling you. So glad. They're, they're, I was so probably, glad to they're calling you for money. <laughs> well, what's what's so <laughs> interesting about this? Like, I have this visual. I just got back from Disney World, and you know, you have these large crowds headed in one direction. And anytime you're trying to fight through those crowds, it just feels really awkward. But I, I see you in 2006 going against those crowds, and then all of a sudden in 2009 the crowd turns around and then you turn around and now you're fighting to get back on the other side. And so it really, uh, it really, again, it's just all about confronting the brutal facts of reality is that there were great lots out there and that recession wasn't going to last forever. And it was just a great opportunity for you to jump in and scoop up these lots at extreme discounts because if banks are making bad decisions about kicking bankable people out the door, they're also making probably poor decisions based on, I guess, whatever the Federal Reserve was requiring them to do. But getting this these lots off their balance sheet, uh, what an awesome time to be on the offensive. So, uh, and, and it was a awesome good time story. to be able to speak the language of bankers. So I was able to sort of pull back some knowledge that I had uh, retained from my days as a banker. And I knew kind of how banks operated. And that was very helpful. And, you know, another uh, banker turned builder uh, in, in town is Dwight Sandlin with Signature Homes. And he, and he was doing the exact thing that I was. So we were not, ex I was not exclusively alone in that. There were other people fighting against that crowd. And um, you know, Brooks and Russ did a great job with that with Harrison Doyle homes. And so th there were other builders in town playing that same game. I was not the only guy out there doing that. So from 2000, let's say 2010 till 2021, how, do you have any idea how many homes you've built in that time? Hmm. I really don't. I uh, probably should. I'm going to, I'm going to. That's know, the difference just... between me and you price. I would have a spreadsheet <laughs> and it would look just like I would be putting tick marks on the wall and uh, you're just like, oh, I don't know, you know, a couple thousand. Well, I, and, I, and I'll be honest in this. Um, <laughs> I, I rarely, I'm rarely accused of being humble, but uh, the, <laughs> an, an area where I am humble is that I really don't build the houses. Um, we have a team of people at Tower Homes that builds the homes. And I, I almost feel ashamed that the company has a portion of my name in its name because on the honestly, with, within the home building part of our business, we, we're in land development, home building and rentals. And, and within, within the home building, that is, that is our most profitable business. And I'm probably involved the least in it of any of the three. I know I am. And, and we just have such a good team of people that I just, I, I don't, I don't, I don't keep count because they're all team wins. And, and again, that's not like some fake humility because I'm, you know, rarely accused of being humble. That's just a fact. It, I'm not the guy building them. I do know some of Price's team members and they are excellent uh, people. Phenomenal. So he, he is uh, speaking the truth. So, you are, I would like to say, Price, you are sexy. Uh, one of the sexiest words in our business right now is build to rent. And you are doing a lot of that. <laughs> and I know been. people have probably waited online just to hear you talk about build to rent. So I'd love to know, I mean, just like everything else, Price, you were doing build to rent before it was cool. I would love to know kind of your, the way you kind of thought about it as a builder and kind of how you got into it and then what it, as it kind of progressed and what it looks like today? Sure. So I started off with single family rentals when I was in my late twenties and early thirties. And when I was flipping and I, I just, 
want, I knew that it might be an avenue to help me get the capital that I so desperately needed to add scale to my business. So I started buying houses and setting them aside. And I'll try to make this as quick as possible. I ended up uh, owning 36 single family homes that I rented and, and managed myself, not nearly as well as you guys manage, but I, I was doing my best. And I put half of them on a 10 year amortization and I put half of them on a 15 year amortization. And out of the 36 homes, not one of them had positive cash flow. And so I was using my, the income from my flipping business to offset the losses from the rental business. And, and what, I, what I say is basically, I feel like I built a room that was the exact dimensions of a treadmill. And I turned that treadmill all the way up to its highest setting of speed and, and, and ramping up. And then I had, a, I had a sort of an escape door that I would just jump in every morning and try to keep running on that treadmill as, as fast as I could because I knew I had a negative cash flow machine. So I, I ran on that treadmill for about seven years. And in that seven years, as luck would have it, and there was a ton of luck involved, um, real estate in Birmingham just appreciated so much. And so those 36 houses had really, really appreciated and naturally, because they were on such aggressive amortizations, I had really knocked down a bunch of debt. And so I sold those houses and I put a lot of money in the bank. And that really helped me get capital. And so I learned a lot doing that. But one thing that really stuck with me is how my rental business and how my flipping business complemented one another. And, I, and that might have been more, a more valuable lesson than the money. And so... You know, as I, I kept thinking about that, I was like, how can how can our home building company possibly uh, complement a rental company? So we had an investor come along and buy some houses of ours that we had built new uh, about five years ago. And they're a national uh, player. And I said, OK, I'll sell you the houses, but it's going to cost you a lunch. And so I, I, because I just had to I had to understand how can you pay me this much for these houses and then rent them? And over the course of that lunch, I just started replaying in my mind, my, my late twenties and early thirties. And I'm like, if they can do it, I can do it. And I don't have to have, you know, 20,000 houses. I can have 200, but um, you know, and so, and so they do. So, so rental homes are really well complemented by new home sales and vice versa. So, you know, being a land developer, we can, we can develop a lot at cost. Uh, being a home builder, we can build a home at cost. We can sell those to ourselves. And I can, so I'm able to wear multiple caps and each of those caps is like a little sliver of profit pie, none of which are sexy, but when added up into a whole pie, you know, you've got the savings from land development, the savings from home building. I'm the long-term investor. Uh, there's not uh, any real estate fees involved and we manage them ourselves. I mean, it's just, each of those little areas, and then you take in some of the advantages of depreciation and appreciation and the financing that we're able to find in the market today. And each one of those little slivers of pie turns into a very attractive pie when you have the ability to produce um, uh, an asset at its wholesale value, especially an asset that appreciates because not many people can manufacture an appreciating asset. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull out some lessons that I just learned from you. Uh, one of them is one of the things that Spencer and I always say is don't quit your day job. When you start investing in real estate, basically your day job is home builder, right? But it's not like right. you jumped out of home builder and started to be home renter, uh, landlord. And so I think people, everybody wants to get in and it feels sexy to be a full-time real estate investor. One of the things I've found is when you, when you don't have like a cash flow machine, like your building business or, or the house flipping business back when you were younger, it makes, it makes investing a lot harder because you have to live out of your investing. And that was one of the mistakes that Spencer and I made when we were living back in 2007 out of each deal that we made, we had to yeah. keep doing deals just to live out of it and it made it even harder. Uh, but if you have a consistent income and you can invest on nights, nights and weekends to get started, um, that's to me, that's very important that people don't quit, quit their day job. Right. The other thing that I have learned recently, and we're starting to experience this here is also having a beachhead where you have something that it, you, you become really good at it. Like you're building is our property management. So when we move into a new market, 
we move in with the thing we know really well, which is property management. And you, you're, you're the same way with building. And what that allows you to do when you get that business going, when you get the flywheel going with that business, it allows you to add verticals on top of it that complement each other. You were talking about how you are a developer, you're a home builder, and now you're a home renter. For us, we're a property manager, a maintenance company, and now we just started a brokerage business. And what's been interesting about that brokerage business is if I was a brand new broker, just getting into real estate without having kind of the Evernest brand behind me, there's no way I would do as many deals as I, maybe I would have done one in the first couple months and that would have been really successful. And we just started a brokerage business essentially in January and we've already done 20 deals with that brokerage mm -hmm. business. Just selling houses to our clients, selling houses that our clients are wanting to sell. Uh, so we have a client over here, a client A, and the client A wants to sell their rental house. Well, we have client B over here that wants to buy a rental house. And so all we're doing is connecting those people, or maybe client B wants to buy 10 more rental houses that we can go to the market and find for him or her. And so I think that's a big lesson that I've learned is once you have a, what I'm calling a beachhead in, 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 and you make sure that the cash cow is being taken care of. It really allows you to add these different businesses on the side. I think a lot of people try to do too many things to start out with versus finding the beachhead. And so I, I just think it's kind of cool how your story is, is matching my m new mental model of how, how our platform businesses uh, is continuing to grow into different verticals. Sure. Yeah. And I, th I think you're really onto it there. And um, it's easy to get distracted um, and, and chase the, the shiny things. But, um, you know, uh, and, and so for years we've heard, oh, gosh, multifamily's hot, multifamily's hot. And I kept thinking that I was doing something wrong by not being a multifamily guy. And they were all the cool kids. Right. And so but I've never been cool. So I don't know why I thought I was missing <laughs> anything there. But uh, so. Uh, but I've just came to realize, you know, what we do well at Tower Homes is we build really, really high quality homes and what I think are the best homes in the price points where we compete. And so how can I how can I take some of what the multifamily guys are doing and, and replicate that in what I already know how to do instead of having some age 50 pivot where I at 50 years old, try to go out and learn how to be a cool kid. I mean, I'm, I, you know, in reality, that ship has sailed and there's guys younger, brighter, smarter, faster. I mean, everything else than me already doing that. So I, I really just needed to find a, a, a way to ramp up uh, what, what we're already doing. Talk about some lessons you've learned. I mean, the houses that you built maybe four years ago when you were starting this, how they compare to the homes you're building for rent today? How have those changed? Well, uh, one thing that I've done throughout my career is I, I just shamelessly ask questions of people who are smarter than I am. And fortunately, that's almost everyone on the planet. So there's a lot of people that I can ask. So that's why I, Spencer I, and I have a podcast. We just ask all the ask good questions, questions and we learn. Just here listening. And, and I've, I, I went back this morning and listened to a lot of your podcast. And you have, you, you have some really good questions that you've asked. And, and a lot of the things that I'm saying have been repeated by guests, uh, were said uh, earlier by guests on, on your show. But um, yeah, so, you know, I, I have made... You know, because I'm older and because I have more money than I used to have, I have the ability to not work as much in my business and spend a little bit more time working on my business. And so I think nothing of setting an appointment with somebody who's really good at built for rent in Florida and getting on a plane and going down and, and spending two days in order to have a one hour meeting with somebody who is 10 years ahead of me in knowledge and asking them the dumbest questions on the planet. Uh, you know, when I go to, I go to a lot of seminars and I'll sit at the seminar and if I like the speaker, you're going to get yourself hurt if you're in between me and that speaker when the speaker is finished, because I will be the first person to shake his hand, get his business card. And I'll tell him, I know you don't believe me, but I'm going to call you next week and I'm going to be at your office. And, and it's just amazing how, how people will open up their playbook. And so to get back to your question, I, I have learned uh, a little bit about, you know, the way built for rent works more efficiently. You know, the house plans are essentially the same. We might modify 
uh, the roof pitch a little bit to pick up some savings there. We might modify the floor coverings a little bit, but the houses are, you know, are, are just not that different uh, in the way that they look and feel than, the, than some of the homes that we retail. They typically are on a smaller lot and not all of them would have a garage. Um, so there, you know, there's a little bit of difference there maybe, but, um, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a radical difference. It's not like we're building some generic box. We still build a pretty darn good looking house, even if it's built for rent. Are you building entire communities that are hundred percent rental or are you scattering these within communities you're building to sell? Both. Uh, so we began scattering them uh, in our subdivisions and that was a good way that, that, that our rental business complemented our home building business. Cause no matter what community you develop and we develop our own communities, um, you know, you're always going to end up with some lots that are maybe a little bit less desirable. And, and so it, we found that if we go ahead and build a rental house on all of the least desirable lots in the community and go ahead and have people living there, that kind of establishes a community more quickly and it gets rid of lots that might've been difficult to sell anyway. So, it so that's a nice way. I'm sorry, Tyrus. So it complements your, your rental business is complementing your, your sales business too, because now you get some energy in the community and it Absolutely. helps you build traction. Yeah. Really interesting. Sure. The, the, the best for sale sign is a moving van. Uh, you know, when you see people moving in, that is the most effective advertising that you can do. So rentals really kind of spur some of our new home communities by taking some of those lots and, and going ahead and putting them into rentals. So, um, you know, uh, but so we have about a hundred homes that we have built in our subdivisions that we have kept and that we rent. And the oldest of those homes is maybe five years old. And then we have uh, three communities around Birmingham where we are doing entirely uh, built for rent. We have a small one with 11 homes in it uh, in the city of Estavia on Green Valley Road, kind of behind Whole Foods, where we're building a very high end luxury rental product. Um, those are renting for about 3000 a month. Uh, really, really nice looking, um, high finished homes. And then we have a community uh, in the city of Leeds, uh, sort of behind the uh, Lowe's and Leeds called the Cottages of Weaver Avenue, where we have 63 built for rent um, garden homes. And then we have one that is uh, we're about to break ground on hopefully next month that will be uh, in the city of Irondale and it will have 174 built for rent cottages and it will be a fully amenitized community with clubhouse pool, fitness center, gated community, the whole thing. It kind of becomes a scattered site apartment community, right? Because are sure. you taking care of all of the landscaping and keeping up with, you know, all the things that need to be kept up with? That varies by community, um, but on our certainly on the ones where we where we have every home in the community, we're providing uh, 100% white glove care, and we're taking care of everything on the outside and the inside of the homes. So this is this has been really awesome, Price. One of the one, I want to kind of wrap this thing up, and you, if anybody can't pick this up from this whole uh, discussion, Price is a voracious learner. He's quoted at least four books that I could count and then is willing to hop on a plane for two straight days to go meet for an hour with people just to learn. And so what I would love to know is talk a little bit about uh, how learning is affected uh, or complements your business and how, how you've continued to grow through learning. Sure. So uh, I, I really have just developed a love for professional development and I read a ton of books, right? I, I use audible. I listen to more books than I read. I'm kind of an ADD guy. So I don't, I don't really enjoy sitting still and reading, but I listen to a ton of books and, you know, um, and, and I think that's, a, that's an area now where people who are getting into this industry have a huge advantage and that they have access to guys like you and your podcast. They have, you know, the videos that you guys have on your website are absolutely phenomenal. And so there's so much knowledge at people's fingertips. They don't have to get on a plane and go meet with a guy in Florida. They can literally sit on their couch and learn so much about real estate. So the speed of learning is much faster now than it was when I started off in this business. Um, however, I still think that real estate is a get rich slow business. And I still believe it takes a long term um, focus. It takes a long-term mindset. I know very few people who have gotten rich quick and stayed rich uh, for a long period of time in real estate. 
and you know you'll see people come in and make a big splash and then they sink uh but uh i think the guys that i know and respect the most in the industry are the people who are committed to getting you know wealthy slow um i think the i, I think i learning whether it is on a podcast or reading books, you know, I love Malcolm Gladwell's concept of 10,000 hours. And I, I think I had a debate with my son who I love dearly. And I, I said, you know, just, I really believe in this concept that it takes about 10,000 hours before you get really darn good at something. And he said, yeah, I'm not sure that I believe that. And I'm like, hmm. Well, we'll see. And, and it might not anymore. I mean, he, he can be right. It might be that you can speed that up and do it in 5,000 because, you know, the, the speed of learning has progressed. But I can just think of a whole lot more examples of guys who maybe spent 10,000 hours before they really got their flywheel turning and got things going. I've read. Well, Price, this has been really awesome. I, I've got a... Um... It's amazing to me that on a podcast, somebody can, you can basically sit with somebody and be a part of a conversation with really successful people. I mean, it's taken me 20 years to get you to call me back, um, Price. So I'm just kidding. Not true. Uh, no, Price is one of the, <laughs> one, is all, he's, he's a taker, but he's a <laughs> great, great, great giver. Um, and it, it, and I've got a sign over my shoulder that you can't see, people can't see since this is on audio, but it l- quotes the late, great Dr. Seuss. The more that you read, the more things you will know, and the more that you learn, the more places you'll go. And I think about, uh, price when I think about that quote, uh, he's a learner, uh, he's going a lot of places and, and listen, uh, he's, he's still in the grind. So uh, super excited about the future price. Thanks so much for being a part of our podcast. Sure. You know, there's another Dr. Seuss quote and I might butcher it, but it says, um, people that matter don't mind and people that mind don't matter. And I think that there is, there's a mindset there of, uh, you know, It might not be the cool thing to rush the speaker at the end of a seminar. It might not be the cool thing to reach out to a total stranger and ask for help. Um, But you just got to get that out of your mind and just go straight to it. Perfect. That's great, Price. Well, listen again, thank you so much for being on the show. And if you have not already subscribed, uh, go ahead and subscribe. I would encourage you to share this uh, episode with as many people as you can who would probably find a lot of value in this. And uh, we will be back in two weeks with another episode of the Birmingham Real Estate Investor.